Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well and enjoying the weather and all. And uh, but I'll tell you this: I'm seeing more people walk in like half-eyed open. So you guys got to stay with me today. Some of you stayed up late for the game, like later than you stayed up since two years ago, the last Packer game. Um, but we're excited about the series we're in right now, entitled Pastor's Choice. And for me, I love these series because we need to. We need to study scripture uh, systematically. And like in two weeks, right after Labor Day, we're going to go into a study of the book of 1 Corinthians. But there are certain times where God will just put something on your heart and you just can't let go of it. So that's what these series are. That's what this message is today. Next week, Ryan will be with you. He'll be sharing something that God keeps putting on his heart. And then I'll finish up the series after that. So um, I want to start this morning with a question that really doesn't need an answer because I think all of us can relate to it. But have you ever found yourself in that point in life or have you ever just completely gotten overwhelmed by life? It may be something short term. It may be something that's situational. It could be the thing like the the assignment you have at work or the test that's coming up or maybe it's the kid that won't eat their veggies or whatever it is. It's it's something small that just is so circumstantial and short-lived, but you got to survive it and you have to press through it. For others living here in Wisconsin, it's this thing called winter. Um, What I realized when I moved here was that whole seasonal thing is real. My second or third year here, moving here from Florida, I had never felt anything like that before. And I'm usually a fairly high energy guy and I was exhausted and I went, actually ended up going to a doctor and just told him what happened. And the doctor was like, congratulations, you have zero vitamin D in your body. And it's a Wisconsin thing. So I had to start taking vitamin D to to kind of supplement some of that. It's, it's real. Sometimes it can leave you feeling like you're in a pit for months. Other times, it's stuff that just gets out of your control. You had a game plan. You knew how things were to go. You had it scripted. You were ready. And it seems like everything has happened except what you scripted. Some of you came out of January into 2021. You were like, I am so done with 2020. You had a game plan for 2021. You like laminated the pages, color coordinated, highlighted, outlined, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, January, February, and you got to like week three and it was shot. And you're looking around going, what? this isn't how it was supposed to go. And sometimes when it doesn't go the way you want, it can put you in a pit for others of you, you may just feel broken. Like something is wrong. You consistently find yourself in a pit. Your mental state is one of a constant fear, depression, anxiety. You may look in the mirror, people see you on the outside and everything seems fine. There's no broken bones, you know, maybe a little backache here and there, no trick knee or anything, but something on the inside just feels broken. You're mentally struggling constantly. And I would say if that's the spot where you are, this morning I want you to hear the first thing I'm going to say is we're all broken. Every one of us. We all have moments in the pit. We're all human and we all have battles. You're not alone. Don't feel like you need to take it on alone. And this isn't something No, it's not a sign that you don't love Jesus. It's not a sign that you just don't have any faith. This goes back well into scripture. We have a prophet by the name of Elijah. We're gonna talk about him again at the end of the message. But Elijah does these amazing, miraculous things. Listen, miracles on a level with Jesus. Okay, he's fighting these prophets of Baal, these wicked, evil prophets, and God sends fire down. I mean, that's, pretty big stuff. What comes out of it? Elijah goes into a depression. He goes into a pit. We have the apostle Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds. In our Bible, everything from Jesus' birth and after is called the New Testament. Paul writes two-thirds of that. God gifted him with the ability to write and think theological, theologically and structured. God made him tough. He survived shipwrecks and snake bites and beatings. And yet we get to 1 Corinthians, and Paul says, I'm depressed. They send Titus to him, and Titus doesn't show up and go, suck it up, Paul. 
He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't correct him. He encourages Paul. And Paul says, I can't thank you enough for sending Titus. How about King David? King David, when you read the Psalms, and we're gonna touch on that in two weeks, but the Psalms, man, the highs are so high and the lows are so low. David battled the pit. He battled going through the struggles of both of those. And we won't even get into all of Job. Job is a life example of what else could go wrong? Oh, that. Well, what? I mean, it can't get any worse than this. Never mind. It's like, how low can we go? The bottom just keeps falling out of his life. This is a biblical challenge. We don't live in a cliche world. Bumper stickers don't solve problems. Memes don't get us out of pits. We need to live beyond that. And it's not just true now. It's been true for a long time. James chapter 5 and verse 10. By the way, all the scriptures will be on the screens or uh, on, our, on the app, mobile device, because there's, we're going to cover a lot of scripture today, and you may want some of these for a later time. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. It says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. This struggle, this pressure, this oppression from the outside and from the inside is not something new. We all go through it. And I want to remind you of this, and we said this in the last series too. Not only is this a physical battle, but this is also a spiritual battle. And we have an enemy who has a PhD in shame. When you find yourself in a pit and you think, nobody cares. Why do I keep ending up here? What did I do wrong? God, why do you hate me? We look at all the problems and it's easy to turn and look on us. And this is where the Bible says, the devil will bury you in shame. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And in Genesis, we have Adam and Eve in the garden, and Satan blames and shames God. I mean, would, would God really say that? I mean, if God is a good and loving God, would he really put those kind of restrictions on you? I mean, let's be real. What kind of God is that? If, if Satan will try and shame and blame God, why wouldn't he do that to me and you? I would say when he does, we're in good company. But remember, the battle is real, and this is where I am so thankful for Jesus. Jesus. Because we've got an accuser. The Bible in in Revelation 12 calls him the accuser of the brethren. And I appreciate this because it's a reminder that the devil is a liar. And some of you need to write that down and remember that because Jesus is our defender. 1 John 2 and verse and, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Peter, uh, John's writing here, and he says, listen, we don't want you to sin, but we also understand sometimes life happens and we do sin, and you can be forgiven. When we confess our sins, Scripture says, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know the lawyer, we know the judge, and we know the bailiff who paid the price for our sin, what we should have been paying, and it's Jesus. So while the devil comes at you to accuse you for everything you've ever done and thought, Jesus is our defender. Now, before I get into this, I'm gonna cover seven things. Before I get into those seven I want to tell you this too. As we cover these, I believe Scripture gives us tools and equips us to help us fight body, soul, and spirit. Our soul is our mind, our will, and emotions. But I also want to say, for those of you who are talking to a doctor or a counselor, this conversation needs to be between you, the Lord, and please don't quit on your counselor. Don't quit on your doctor. You don't stop a medicine like right now. Have those conversations, do it well, do it right. 
but lean into scripture. Lean into what God says for us in the pit. Now, how can I overcome the pit? What are some tools to help me do that? Number one, avoid feeding the depression. Avoid feeding the depression. Stop adding water to the mud hole. It just pulls you down. Here's what one author said. Feeding depression creates a snowball effect. For example, if you throw a few crumbs out on your balcony or sidewalk, a few pigeons will show up. If you keep throwing out crumbs, by the end of the week, a multitude of pigeons will have flocked to the area. Similarly, depression thrives on doubts, fears, and negative thoughts, which feeds more depression. Learn to identify the negative thoughts and worries that are fueling your depression so you can replace them with positive or more realistic thoughts. Here's how we taught it to our kids. You have two dogs in your life. You have two pets. One of them loves you. It will fight for you. It goes out in front of you, and anyone who tries to get into your life, it will make sure that person is okay, or it will keep them at bay. It's a good, a loving dog. It cares for you. The second dog is Cujo. And if you're not paying attention, it will go for your throat. It will jump your back. It'll let the worst people in and keep the good people out. Now, my question is, which dog are you feeding? You can only feed one dog. Which dog are you feeding? Don't feed, don't fuel the depression. Here's how Philippians says it. The Bible says it this way, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about such things. Don't allow yourself to get sucked deeper into the pit, into the hole. Don't feed it. Roman, um, <coughs> Romans 8 and verse 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For me, I know at least twice a month, sometimes it's more, sometimes I don't get to it this much, but I, at least twice a month, I need to make sure I positive journal with no ifs, ands, or buts. Like, this is going well, but that ends next week. Or I think this is going to work, but it may not. Nope, what is going well? I have to journal out the positives to make sure I feed that in my life. And here's one warning I would give, because some of you journal, but all you write down is your prayer request, and you never journal the victories. And what ends up happening is you have a mile deep of problems. And God's going, yeah, but what about the breakthrough over here? Thanks, God, but, but what about this? God may not get to this list right away. He may be dealing with this over here. And this may be opening the door to this. You don't know. I don't know. Make sure you don't just feed the negative. Second one is very similar to the first one. It's focus on what you're doing and see the wins. Focus on what you're doing and see the wins. For me, the key word in this one is that very first word, focus. Focus, because I may know what I need to do. I may know what God has called me to do. I know what my, my list for today is that must get done. But I'll watch a video or two first. The next thing you know, I am three hours into cat videos. And then comes sports videos, and then comes bloopers and fails. I love those. Then comes news videos, then comes music videos. And the next thing you know, everything I was supposed to be focused on is gone. Everything that was productive and proactive in my life has been lost. I can get caught up on so many different things and grasp for things I think are important. But God says something different. Matthew Chapter 6, beginning at verse 25. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, 
that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. One thing I've learned, just kind of embrace, is this. Regret is a life that's trying to control the past. Anxiety comes from a life that's trying to control the future. What does Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I'll take care of this other stuff. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. Don't live with regret of trying to control the past. It's over. And you may have a ton of regrets you're not letting go of. Don't live grasping the regrets. You can't control the future. You'll end up racked with anxiety. Let it go. Focus on today. Take care of today. Number three, when we get stuck in a pit, I think this one's crucial. We need to maintain life-giving relationships. We need to maintain life-giving relationships. We are built, created for relationships. Some of us more than others, I'm a little bit of an extrovert. Uh, Others of you I know are introverts. You love the quarantine, let's be real. You, if you never had to go back to work, if you never had to see certain people, for some of you, if you never had to see people, you would have been just fine. But all of us, whether your circle is big or it's a small inner circle, we were all created for relationship. And when we get into a pit, we need to lean into those relationships and not run away from them. Dr. Brene Brown, she's a researcher, she told the story about a village where all the women used to go down at the same time and wash their clothes together. Same time of day, same length of time, all the women would connect at the river. Now as progress happened and electricity came in and then running water came in, the next thing that came in were washing machines. And within a year, year and a half of the washing machines coming in, depression ran rampant through the women in the city. They had lost their time of connecting. We are wired for community. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Proverbs 18 and verse 24, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, I'm going to sound like a video on repeat with this, but this is why we lean so heavily into our life groups. I love church like this. I love church in rows. I love singing together and worshiping together. That's why I'm choosing it for my last topic on pastor's choice. I love learning together and and being in a similar uh, passage and studying it. But we need those moments where we have life happening in circles, where people know us and people can pray for us. And when I say know us, I don't mean the church you who shows up. I mean the real you Monday through Friday or Saturday or Sunday morning till about 2 a.m. People who know the real you, that when you show up in these groups, and you may show up here and it's all fine, but you show up in your, in your life group and someone says to you, how are you doing? And what's the typical response? Fine. Kids are fine, job is fine, marriage is fine, health is fine. You need that person in your life who can go bull in Jesus' name. (laughs) You need people who know you. And man, 
our life group, it's a time we celebrate together, we laugh together, we pray together, we eat together, hallelujah, we, and we study together, but we know each other as well. And if what I've realized is some people aren't ready to put that kind of investment in, but it's also the very people who, when life gets hard, tend to withdraw. In depression is when we need people, but what do we tend to do? We tend to isolate. Lean in to relationships. I tell people all the time, if, all the time, if you have a decent study in your life group, but your relationships are real, and your talk and your prayer is authentic, that's a home run. If you have the deepest, most profound and prolific study, but there's not an ounce of authenticity in the people in the room, that's a miss. We need good and godly relationships. Number four, avoid perfectionism. Avoid perfectionists. And some people get stuck in a pit because we think we are a failure at everything we do. We need to avoid the mentality of perfectionism. Some of you were raised with this idea that you had to be perfect. Yeah, you got an A, but it wasn't an A+. Yeah, you guys won the game, and you did well, but man, Tommy killed it. Susie was amazing. Sure, you got near the top, but you weren't the top. And so you've lived with this idea, I've got to be perfect. And it's a lie. It is unattainable. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You won't be perfect. There are times where we miss the mark. Sometimes it's marks we set for ourselves. Sometimes it's what God has set for us. But as I said earlier, we have forgiveness available. Give yourself permission to breathe because you can't and you won't be perfect. I'm not saying to go look for trouble. Don't go look for the first sin you can embrace. But what I am saying is realize you're not perfect. You're not the perfect employee. You're not the perfect boss. I'm not the perfect pastor. You're not the perfect husband or wife, boyfriend or girlfriend. You're not the perfect student. You're not the perfect parent. And you need to be okay with that. You need to embrace that. We'll all continue to grow. But how does growing usually happen? Through failing. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. And even in saying that, I think it points out that we are perfect for each other. We are imperfect people who serve a perfect Savior. Give yourself permission to breathe. You're not going to get it right 100% of the time. A few weeks ago, about a month ago, I was finishing a message here. Went out the door. Lady caught me and says, my favorite illustrations are the illustrations where you failed. <laughs> and I'm like, I got lots of those. But don't we all appreciate the moments when, not when everything went perfect and life never went wrong and this person just saw the face of Jesus like every morning at 9.15, 10.15, 11.45 and noon. I mean, I, I listened to some of those, the testimonies. I was like, man, what planet are you on? I appreciate when God helped people up and cleaned up the skinned up knees and elbows and helped them get back on the right track because that's a world and a life I seem to find myself in a lot. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And we need to realize that. We need permission to breathe. Romans chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 3 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. One, you'll end up arrogant. You'll end up prideful or boastful. Or two, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Because there is nowhere to go with perfection but down. Don't set this unrealistic view of perfection. Avoid perfectionism. I battle this one. Not because I think I have to be perfect. I'm old enough to know better on that. But when you're dealing with people you love and you care for, man, you just want it to go well. You want it to go right. 
I know that as pastor at Spring Lake, as a pastor, this is just the, the hard facts with pastoring, 7 to 10% of the people in a church are not going to like a decision I make. 7 to 10%. Doesn't mean they hate me. They may. But I know they're not going to be happy. And guess what happens when I make this 7 to 10% happy? This 7 to 10% is not happy. I got to be okay with that. Every answer is not going to be perfect. And it's not going to please everyone. As a husband, I'd love to be the perfect husband. But I'm not. And if Gina was here, you'd hear an amen. I'd love to be the perfect dad. I'd love to have every right answer and, and I go to them, but I have learned grown children are gonna make grown children decisions. And sometimes I have to back up. I don't want them to have to learn anything the hard way. But they have to make their choices and lo and behold, sometimes their choices are the right ones. We're not gonna be perfect and we have to realize that. Second Corinthians 12, verse 9, God says to Paul, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Let go of the idea of perfectionism. Number five, set your messages aside. Set your messages aside. What do I mean by that? Your, I said it before, your soul, your, your mind, your will, and your emotions, they need a break every once in a while. Turn off your messages. Think of how many inboxes you have in your life. Your phone, your voicemail, text messages. Uh, how many different social media do you have? All of those have an inbox. They're feeding into your life. You have a work email. Some of you have a home email. Some of you have three or four emails just for the spam that you get. All of us have a lot of emails or inboxes and they're all feeding to us. And every once in a while, you have got to stop, turn it off, and I'll say it a different way, but the same word, and breathe. Give your mind a chance to release, to relax. Romans 12, one and two says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you can't do that if it's never off, if the inboxes are never shut down. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Your mind is valuable. Don't give it space away to just anybody. Turn off the tension. Take a break. Go for a walk with no device. You'll find yourself like looking at your hand after a while. We are so programmed. Go for a walk where you can just think. And at first you, won't, you may not even know what to think about. You'll have to relearn how to think. Have a conversation with someone with your phone on uh, airplane mode. You may need to have that conversation with someone over the phone, but have it with someone who brings life to you. Give your mind a chance to recover. You have to understand, we were not wired to be in go mode. We were not wired to fight all the time. We weren't created that way. Our body, when tension hits, our body is made to release serotonin. Serotonin is what keeps you calm. It's what, it's what levels you out. You can run your body dry on serotonin. When serotonin drains from your body, your body's next response is adrenaline. You know what adrenaline does? Fight or flight. So when you constantly have it coming at you, when it's a barrage of messages or people or things on the screen or memes or posts or whatever, and even now that you look at that thing for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you're thinking about it and it's stirring in your mind. And you wonder why we get higher anxiety levels. It's because we drain our serotonin. We're looking to fight or we're looking to run away. Give yourself a chance to breathe. David does this in the book of Psalms. Psalm 13 and verse two. It says, how long will my enemies triumph over me? My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fail, or when I fall. But I trust 
in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. My enemy's coming. The problems are coming. The inbox is full, and that stuff's not going anywhere. But I will trust in the Lord. He has been good. He has been faithful. His love is unfailing. Turn off the depressing stuff for a while. Turn off the anxiety driving stuff for a while. Let go of the battle and renew your mind. Here's number six. Delegate. Delegate. You can't do it all. There's an adage, old adage, maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. If you want something done, ask a busy person to do it. Why? Because busy people many times don't know how to say no. And they'll want to make sure it gets done. You have to delegate. You feel like you have too much on your plate? You need to delegate. Oh, no, no, I can't delegate. Why? Because I want it done right. And some of you in the name of that statement have refused to give up anything. And not only are you in a pit because of it, but you've actually started burying yourself in this pit. In the name of, I want it done right. John Maxwell says, if someone can do something 80% as well as you, turn it loose because the last 20%, they'll do it creatively. They'll do it in a way you never would have thought of. We need to delegate and not bury ourselves. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. It allows you to open your hands. Delegate. We get a great picture of this in Exodus 18. It's this guy named Moses. He's leading the people of Israel. They're coming out of, uh, of slavery and bondage. They're headed to the promised land. God has a land set for him. And this isn't like 50 people. Think about the size of the city of Milwaukee. And he's leading this by himself. And he is burying himself. We have a water shortage over here, food shortage over here. We've got two villages fighting over here. We've got a, a disease problem going on over here. Our armies can't seem to get it together. We're out of spears. Uh, we got to get that. He's trying to do it all himself. We got these two people fighting. We got major problems. I'll handle all of it. And Moses' father, Jeth father-in-law, Jethro, which I appreciate because I've got a good father-in-law too. Jethro shows up and says to Moses, you are going to lose your mind. This is going to kill you. You've got to delegate. You've got to be able to hand some of this stuff off. And he does. It's an amazing account, Exodus 18. And I understand it looks different for different people in different phases in life and different jobs. My home right now is me and Gina and a few pets. Some of you still have littles running around. Some of you have a lot of littles running around. What it looks to, like to delegate, you need to have that conversation with husband, wives, older kids. What does it look like? But I'll tell you this, if you keep just saying yes and you keep taking on and thinking I'll do it myself, you will end up in a pit. Be cautious with that. Number seven, last one, very practical one. We need to counter depression with exercise, activity, and rest. Counter depression with exercise, activity, and rest. These bodies are machines. Our body, our soul, mind, will, and emotions, and our spirit, they're, they're interactive. They all are tied together. And when one thing starts to fall apart, it starts to affect other areas of your life. We need to take care of, we need to be good stewards of what God has given us. We need to be careful of what we put in and what our of what our body is running on. Some of you would never put the level of gasoline in your car equivalent to the level of food that you put in yourself. Some of you put better food in your pets, in your dogs, than you put in yourself. I'm going to sound like your mama for just a minute. Eat your vegetables. Eat the good stuff, the healthy stuff for you. With everything Gina has been going on with this, with battling cancer right now, we've learned a whole new broad scope of what it means to eat well and eat healthy. And we've seen amazing results because of it. Because of it. I told you about the vitamin D struggle I have. I know the food that produces vitamin D, and I lean into it now. 
Eat in a way that you're taking care of the machine God has given you. Move. We were created to exercise and move. What you don't use, you will lose. I always laugh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. It says these outer bodies are wasting away. I remember in my 20s, like, not this body. Now I'm like, what's falling off next? But I, I try and take care of myself. I do the best I can. I understand it is a tool for God's purposes. I'm not doing it to impress anybody except Gina, but that's a different story. Um, but we need to take care of what God has given us. Take care of your body. It will affect your mind. We talked about Elijah earlier. Elijah takes on the prophets of Baal, whoops them all. God sends down fire. Amazing account. But then Elijah goes into a a depression, deep depression. They're going to kill me. Nobody cares. God shows up. You know what? God doesn't go, suck it up, Elijah. Look at everything I did. You know what a God does? Honest truth. You know what God does to Elijah? Here's what God does. He goes, Elijah, go take a nap. Yes! (laughs) Go, just go take a nap. And then when Elijah wakes up from the nap, he goes, here, eat. And now go take another nap. We've got to take care of these bodies. And it's not until Elijah gets his feet back under him and gets healthy again that God says to him, listen, I've got a lot of other people in this area that are still serving me. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't let it wear you down. Take care of yourself. Body, soul, and spirit. We need to feed ourselves in all three of those areas. Now, one more slide, short one. What if it's not you going through this? Once again, all of this is online, uh, video or uh, in the notes if, if, if you know someone going through this. But here's the quick thing I would tell you in the process of maybe walking with someone along in this process. First of all, Romans 12 tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It is so comforting to know someone is willing to walk alongside of you deeper than just a pat on the back. Hope you make it when someone is feeling this as deep as you are. Secondly, pray for them. Pray with them. Because as we said earlier, this is a spiritual battle. And the devil wants to do us in. Pray for them. Pray with them. It will be encouraging. And thirdly, don't give advice unless asked. And I had an older gentleman tell me this one time, and it's so true. Don't give advice unless asked. Maybe ask twice. Some of us are loaded for bear. We are ready with an opinion on everything everyone else is going through. I can solve all your problems. My life's a mess, but boy, I can solve all of your problems. You don't need an answer for everything. Job. Job went through all this stuff. Job's friends show up in his worst worst moment. Good for them. Job's friends sit with him for days, even weep with him. Good for them. And then Job's friends open their mouths and the problems begin. Let your presence speak as much as your words. Be there in that moment. That's what trustworthy friends do. If you feel like you're in over your head, get help. We have a biblical counseling team within the church. Maybe they don't want anything to do with the Bible. Make sure they're talking to someone. If it's something you can't handle, someone who can encourage them along. And always remember there's hope. When Jesus is involved, always remember there's hope. Last illustration and I'm done. We have a dog this big. Her name's Daisy. It's Gina's dog. It's this big. It is a Chihuahua and a Jack Russell Terrier. And this dog, if the smoke alarm goes off, will go nuts. Gina has trained this dog that no matter why the smoke alarm is going off, this dog will not stop barking until it's rewarded. So it could be that the fireplace has smoke billowing out of it and the smoke alarm's going off. It could be that something is actually on fire and the smoke alarm is going off. Or it could be the fact that there's a piece of toast that stayed in the toaster too long. Whatever the reason, that dog will let us know when there's a problem. Here's my challenge to you. Don't ignore the smoke alarms in your life. Don't ignore when you start finding yourself in the pit. Don't allow yourself to back out and say, nobody cares anyway. God, what did I do wrong? 
Lord, it must be, and we try and fill in the blank. I, I'm going to screw it up anyway. I'm not perfect. Don't ignore the smoke alarms. And when these seasons of life hit, don't run from God. Run to him. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I'm going to keep this simple. Maybe you're in a pit. It could be circumstantial. It could be short term. You see light at the end of the tunnel. For some of you, it just feels like it's life. Like I said earlier, maybe you feel like something's broken. I know the circumstances some of you are facing. I know the challenges are real. And in no way do I belittle them. As a matter of fact, I want to pray for you in them, right where you are. After service, there'll be prayer partners who will continue praying for you. But if that's where you are, you're in the pit this morning. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Just for encouragement to win today. And then win tomorrow, and then win Tuesday, and then win, win Wednesday. Thank you. Remember, focus on today. Thank you. Because tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Thank you. Thanks. God, you never said that this earth was going to be our heaven. This is not our reward. And this life can be a battle. And Jesus, I pray now for those who are stuck in a pit, who are facing the challenges that life is throwing at them, that are facing the challenges that our own bodies sometimes throw at us, and realistically facing the challenge an enemy who hates us is throwing at us. And Lord, I pray for peace to be able to lean into you, to recognize your presence is there, even in the pit. You said when we're on the mountaintop, you're there with us. When we make our bed in Sheol, in the pit of hell, God, you'll be there with us as well. And Lord, for those whose life right now feels like hell, I pray, God, for your presence to be strong. In Jesus' name we pray.